excellencies, ministers, Professor Babatunde, friends, colleagues, and all the champions of family planning that are here today. My thanks go to the government of Indonesia, represented by Bika Kabian and the president, and to the Gates Institute at Johns Hopkins. All of us here know we've been working on these issues and, and against this challenge for some time. And it's great that global leaders, including Melinda Gates, are bringing more attention to the issues that keep family planning at the top of the global health agenda. As Melinda was saying, we really have much to do and no time to lose. So it's great that we got this important conference back on the calendar so quickly after its postponement. And thank you, Ying, in particular, for all of your and your team's efforts for that. At the Gates Foundation, we want to see a world where every person has the opportunity to lead a healthy, productive life. It's a simple idea and a grand ambition. And one critical factor to achieving it is empowering women and girls to transform their lives and thereby the lives of their families and communities and nations. We know that better health, better education, and better economic opportunities for women and girls are the first steps to building more prosperous communities and countries. We also know that unplanned pregnancy puts all of that at risk. That's why our Family Planning 2020 goal is ambitious, because the ripple effects, as Melinda said, are so enormous. And it's also an important milestone in, on the road to the vision of universal access that was set out in the Sustainable Development Goals. Thanks to the hard work of everyone in this room, we are beginning to see considerable progress. Indonesia, in particular, deserves enormous credit for introducing a comprehensive family planning strategy that is saving lives, improving health, and putting the country on track to reach its ambitious FP 2020 goal. Likewise, the Ouagadougou Partnership in Francophone West Africa recently exceeded its ambitious family planning goal by almost 20%. The dedication of this community is transforming the lives of women, their families, and their societies across the world. That's the good news. The bad news is that while this progress, as welcome as it is, is impressive, it isn't yet matching the scale of our global ambition. We're falling behind, and we owe it, as Melinda said, to millions of women and girls around the world who are still missing out to get back on track. To do that, we need to act smarter, we need to act together, and above all, we need to act now. It'll be too late to reach our ambitious goals if we put off our decisions for another couple of years. Our approach has to start with examining the evidence and analyzing the data so that we know what's working and just as importantly, what isn't. In November, Family Planning 2020 released three years of very rich data as a, that we as a community must use to identify the gaps and the opportunities to accelerate progress. Many of you have seen the annual report of FP 2020. I would encourage you, if you haven't done it, to look at the data annex, which gives, is full of rich information that can guide our efforts, the kind of information that historically the family planning movement has lacked. FP 2020, as a movement, is shifting its focus and prioritizing a few key areas to do just that. You'll hear more about that throughout the week and at Thursday's FP 2020 uh, plenary. For our part as a foundation, as Belinda said, we've identified three areas we believe have great potential to accelerate progress towards our shared FP 2020 goal. Melinda announced in her, her message that we'll be committing an additional $120 million over the next three years against these areas. Let me tell you a little bit more about them. First, advocacy. There's a critical need to make the case consistently and compellingly for budgets, policies, and programs that ensure that more women and girls can access contraceptives, contraceptive services. Investing in family planning is one of the best investments countries can make. If a young girl is able to prevent unplanned pregnancies, she's more likely to complete her education. If a woman spaces her pregnancies, she can more fully participate in the economy and has a better chance of lifting herself and her family out of poverty. 
If she has fewer children, both she and her children are more likely to be healthier. And when health improves, life improves by every measure. So not only does everyone benefit, those benefits last a lifetime. Getting that message across will be especially important over the next two years if we are to get back on track for FB 2020's ambitious goals. So we're supporting the efforts of this community by helping to grow support for family planning at global, national, and increasingly at subnational levels, investing in advocates and engaging new, young, and diverse campaigners to make sure that the issue remains firmly on the agenda. Second, improving the quality of services that women and girls receive, by getting, and in particular by getting the private sector more involved. Everyone deserves quality services no matter where they get their contraceptives. And that means better counseling and information, and it means comprehensive access to a full range of family planning methods. In particular, the long-acting reversible and injectable uh, contraceptives that are among the most effective and, as the data shows, are often the methods that women prefer. Expanding the number and type of contraceptives available is critical. Data from the past 30 years show that when one additional contraceptive method is made available to at least half the population, total use consistently increases by up to 8 percent. Expanding contraceptive choice is critical to quality of services, and the private sector has an important role to play alongside the public sector in providing access to that wider range of contraceptive choices. Research shows that nearly half of all women in their reproductive years in Asia and Latin America and the Caribbean rely on social marketing organizations, pharmacists, and community clinics run by local midwives for their family planning needs. In Sub-Saharan Africa, about a third do. These trends highlight the importance of ensuring high quality services across the board and are encouraging us to think differently about where we apply our efforts. If the evidence shows that women and girls increasingly use private health services, then that is where we need to reach them and that's where we'll be needing to invest. With this in mind, we believe it makes sense to build on successful programs which are bringing commercial rigor and techniques to the family planning sphere. As such, we will support social marketing organizations with a flexible financing model to deliver higher quality services and offer a wider range of contraceptives at affordable prices. Not only will this complement what's available in the public sector, it will help us to provide services to more women and girls, including some of the hardest to reach. Which brings me to our third focus area. We will fund programs that expand access for some of the most marginalized. In particular, the evidence shows that we can have a big impact by increasing resources to the urban poor, who are among the world's most disadvantaged and disenfranchised groups. Over the last few years, program and evaluation experts in India, Nigeria, Kenya, and Senegal have tested and identified a variety of high-impact solutions. In concert with other programs, these have improved the quality of services, boosted demand, and increased access to contraceptive options for more women and girls. Across six cities in Nigeria, for instance, the percentage of women using modern contraceptive co methods increased by 10.5% over a four-year period. In Senegal, there was a 19% point increase over the same period among the poorest wealth quintile across six cities, with one, one city actually recording a 24% point increase. These exciting results are understandably generating demand from other local governments that want to replicate these solutions in their local communities. So through a new challenge initiative, we will offer incentive for donors and country programs to expand these proven interventions across parts of Africa and Asia. The Gates Foundation will support regional hubs that cover the costs of providing technical assistance to governments and to get these proven innovations off the ground. And with the largest generation of young people in history about to enter their reproductive years, an essential part of this work, as Melinda highlighted, will be to reach young people. So we will also make specific investments to quickly learn how to more efficiently and more effectively reach adolescents. Advocacy, improving quality, and spreading access to the urban poor and adolescents are not the only areas where progress can be accelerated. 
There are simply the ones where the data indicates we can make a significant difference. At this conference, we need to challenge each other on where and what else needs to be done. Where does the evidence and the, and the data lead us? And most importantly, what concrete steps can we take to get back on track for the 2020 goal as soon as possible? Each of us has a role to play. As donors, we must ask ourselves, what more can we do to align our funding and support with the cost it plans that other governments have in place? If you're a government minister, ask yourself, what more can I do to provide women and girls in my country with the full range of contraceptives that they want and need? And if you're an advocate, ask yourself, what more can I do to hold governments and other development partners to account? We have the expertise and the experience right here this week uh, to achieve a world where women and girls are empowered to make their own decisions about their own lives. A world where they don't just survive, but thrive. Let's make the most of it. Thank you.